Hello, everybody, and welcome to the webinar. We will get started in just a few minutes. So happy you could join us. And as you are joining, please go ahead and in the chat, tell us your name and where you are Zooming in from and what organization you work in. We'll see where everybody is coming from. Welcome everyone. We've got Colorado, of course, New Jersey, Alliance for New Jersey, EE, yay. All over the country, look at this. Canada, Maine. Really great mix of um, participants from all over. Welcome. And for those of you just joining, we'll get started in a minute. Just have a few intro slides until everybody gets signed on. We've got great representation from New Jersey. Judy, I expect nothing less. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Wow, what a wonderful mix. And I bet a lot of the people that are signing in were involved in this effort, which is really exciting. Okay, we'll get started in 15 seconds. Hello, everybody. We have Florida. We have San Diego, fantastic. Shelburne Farms. Yay, Cincinnati, Ohio, my hometown. Hello, high school English teacher. This is fantastic. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Welcome to all of you as you are joining and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Judy Browse, and I'm the Executive Director of the North American Association for Environmental Education. And we are so excited to see so many of you joining us today to talk about climate change and education and how we're looking across the curriculum. And we are so honored and excited today to have the First Lady of New Jersey, Tammy Murphy, with us to help moderate a panel of amazing educators on what is happening with climate change education the new standards and what it means for not just New Jersey, but throughout the country. And as many of you know, New Jersey is the first state in the country to incorporate climate change standards through K through 12, a true interdisciplinary approach, which is really serving as a model for the rest of the country. And many feel that this is actually going to transform how we think about climate change, how we think about environmental education and how to make this cross disciplinary. So the First Lady will say a few words about all of this and introduced our distinguished panel of educators featuring three top-notch educators from New Jersey, Tracy Maiden, Hank Bitten, and Kelly Stone, who are all involved in education in New Jersey and this effort. And then also Frank Neopold from NOAA, who will give us more of a national perspective. And I also wanna thank Stephanie Lagos, the Chief of Staff to the First Lady for helping to organize all of this. So for those of you who are new, um, these webinars that NAA has been putting on are to bring new ideas and insights to the field of environmental education and all our related fields. And it's not just um, to bring new ideas, it's also how do we cope during this pandemic? So we're trying to bring new ideas, new thinking to the field of EE, and also especially having more webinars during this time to engage more of our educators across the country who really are struggling during this really difficult time. So thank you all, all of you who are out there for all you're doing. I also wanna thank Ann Umali, who is our Director of Professional Development and she does all our EE360 management. She's fantastic. If you need any help, she's there. I wanna thank our affiliate co-hosts. NWA has affiliates across North America that are doing such great work to strengthen environmental education across the country. So thank you with a special call out to our friends at the Alliance for New Jersey Environmental Education for all you do. And thanks to all the board and volunteers in New Jersey and Beth for your leadership. So 
I know you've been on about 8 billion Zoom calls, but still, the way to communicate, you're all on mute. We can't see you, but we know you're out there. You can either send a message to all the panelists or to everyone. Just go to the chat room and look at the pull down menu. And we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to have you include um, any questions you have, any resources into the chat box. And I just want you all to know you'll get a copy of the PDF of the PowerPoint, the comments from the chat and a recording. And this webinar is one hour and 15 minutes. And we do have live captioning today. So thanks to Jenna, so that anybody needing help with audio will be able to have that. And now um, the best part um, is introducing the first lady and our panelists. So first I'll start with turning this over, whoops, excuse me, to the first lady. It is truly my honor um, to introduce first lady of New Jersey, Tammy Murphy, who has led these efforts to transform climate change education in the state of New Jersey. The First Lady has a long record of service and has supported issues to create a healthier, a greener, and a more resilient world. She has been a leader and advocate for family, education, service, and leadership. She has worked with nonprofit organizations focused on environmental education, healthcare, youth, and family services. She's also had a defining role to play in supporting the arts and transatlantic relations. She has worked in finance both at home and in Europe, and she partnered with her husband representing the United States during his appointment as the U.S. Ambassador to the Federal Republic of Germany. Upon returning home, the First Lady and Governor Murphy founded New Start New Jersey, an organization aimed at exploring ways to help grow the middle class and jumpstart the state's economy. The First Lady has a background in English and communications. She's currently a visitor emerita of the University of Virginia Board of Visitors. And she also serves as Secretariat and is a charter member of the Climate Reality Action Fund, which is an organization, as many of you know, that was founded by Al Gore. It was her vision that helped make New Jersey the first state to approve climate change education standards across the curriculum, touching seven interdisciplinary areas from science to social studies to the arts. We are so lucky to have the First Lady with us today to introduce the panel and moderate this wonderful group of educators. Welcome, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction, Judy, and for your dedication to conservation and education. Uh, we are so grateful to you, the North American Association of Environmental Education and all those who have worked for decades to bring the issue of climate change to the attention of the public. Uh, it is because of your tireless work that this generation of students is so incredibly inspired and determined to fix the climate crisis. That mission, uh, resolving the damage that human activity has done to the environment since the 19th century, is an incredible burden that our children and grandchildren will have to face. For decades, the debate around climate change has continued without much significant progress. But I'm proud to say that this past June, as Judy just told you, um, New Jersey's educational system became the first public school system to admit that climate change is a real tangible problem that this generation of children will be required to face and further that it is our duty to, to prepare them for that certain future. New Jersey is warming at a rate faster than all other states. Our shorelines are vanishing. We have harmful algal blooms. Rain comes in torrential downpours and our summers are blazing hot. All of this as a direct result of climate change will cost New Jersey a projected 10 billion, with a B, dollars time has begun to run out. Despite that, I am incredibly optimistic. By including climate change education across all core subjects from kindergarten through high school graduation, every New Jersey student will be prepared to explore, imagine, and advocate for the innovative solutions needed in the communities in which they live. And as often is the case, New Jersey's incredible public school teachers will be at the crux of this important initiative. New Jerseyans value a commitment to academic rigor and the pursuit of knowledge. We believe in the power that education holds to change the course of a person's life. Our educational professionals do even more than educate. 
They teach our students to be good citizens. It's no surprise then uh, that New Jersey's educators have responded to the addition of climate change education standards with their characteristic enthusiasm and passion. They recognize how important this is, but as with any new requirement, they are searching for the best way to incorporate it. Today, we're going to begin an important discussion on how to do just that. From elementary school to high school, in social studies, art, math, English, world languages, and beyond, the preparation of our students to fight climate change and fill the jobs of the future green economy will be just as broad and far-reaching as the effects of climate change itself. And to help us begin this con conversation, we have some incredible educators with us today. Kelly Stone is a K-5 STEM teacher from the Long Branch Public School District. She is a chair of the district's executive green team and an active participant in her school's green and garden committees. Kelly established and advises the students after school clubs focused on the environment and climate change education and maintains the school's certification with Sustainable Jersey for Schools. With her efforts, the George Catherine Brown School was the 2019 elementary school champion, accumulating the highest point value in the state of New Jersey. Her school earned the U.S. Department of Education Green Ribbon Schools Award and the Eco <clears throat> Green Flag for Schools. And I had the utmost pleasure in visiting the school in 2018 for Earth Day. She is currently training with the Climate Reality Leadership Corps. Kelly, you should know that the, uh, that the wooden board that your team, your team of students gave to me sits in my office to this day. Tracy Naden is a K-5 staff and student support teacher, the Highland Park School District Green Team Coordinator and environmental activist. She has been instrumental in the district tackling issues of climate change, clean energy, water shortages, and environmental pollution. She is currently participating in the Sustainable Jersey for Schools certification program for New Jersey public schools and led the Highland Park School District to bronze level certification. Through this certification program, she has worked for years to initiate, implement, and connect students with curricula in environmental and science technology, engineering, and mathematics education. Hank Fitton is the executive director of the New Jersey Council for, the so for Social Studies. He is a retired high school social studies supervisor, a teacher in the New Jersey uh, Governor's School for International Studies at Ramapo College, and past president and member of the Board of Trustees for the New Jersey Council for History Education. He is a curriculum consultant, lead writer for the New Jersey Social Studies Standards, which incorporated climate change education this year, and co-editor of the journal Teaching Social Studies. He has a written, he has written Changing Perceptions, One Click at a Time, a Curriculum Guide, Core Standards and Performance Assessment, and was an editor for World History, The Human Odyssey, as well as numerous book reviews and articles. Frank Niepold is the Climate Education Coordinator at NOAA's Climate Program Office, a co-chair of the U.S. Global Change Research Program's Education Interagency Working Group, the U.S. Climate Action Report Education Training and Outreach Chapter Lead for the U.N. Framework Convention on Climate Change, Education and Youth Delegate for the United States at the 2015 Conference of Parties, and a member of the Federal Steering Committee for the Fourth National Climate Assessment. At NOAA, he develops and implements NOAA's climate goal education and outreach efforts. Frank is the teaching climate lead for NOAA's climate.gov web portal that offers learning activities and curriculum materials, multimedia resources, and professional development opportunities for formal and informal educators who want to incorporate climate science into their work. Welcome to one and all of our incredible panelists and thank you all for taking the time to be here. So I'm gonna jump right in. Um, our opening question is for all four of our panelists. From each of your areas of expertise, can you please share generally your thoughts around New Jersey becoming the first state in the nation to incorporate climate change education throughout all K-12 core content areas, as well as briefly share the work you have done or plan to do around climate change education. Um, why don't we begin with Hank? 
Well, hello, everyone. Thank you, uh, Tammy, uh, for that nice introduction. Uh, look, climate uh, change issues uh, have been uh, on my burner for the last 30 years. Uh, it's probably the most urgent issue that's uh, affecting children today. Uh, a child born this year, uh, graduate high school in 2038. If you just think back 20 years to the turn of the century and Y2K, um, imagine the changes that have happened in the last 18, 20 years that will happen in a lifetime of these children. Uh, the issue is, uh, is critical uh, because in just a few years, as all of you know, uh, the average daily or average annual temperature of the earth is going to be uh, 1.5 degrees. And that's kind of the threshold uh, until we are gonna see some major changes. And the projection is that it is gonna increase uh, a half a degree approximately every 20, 25 years. Carbon emissions, much like the current uh, COVID-19 virus, is an invisible enemy. You don't see it happening, but the effects, as Tammy alluded to, torrential rainfall, uh, extreme heat, extreme cold, uh, we see these changes. Part of my teaching has always included the effects of climate changes on the Egyptians, drought leading to famine, uh, the Chinese, um, the bubonic plague, torrential rainforms. Uh, when you have these tremendous precipitation switches and changes, the environment becomes a, a petri dish for new viruses. So the kinds of changes that, uh, that take place are gonna have uh, a, an unfortunate but a, a very deep impact on people. My big concern as a uh, lead writer, education works. Um, education is the cheapest way, the least expensive way to address this problem. If we are able to change the behavior of students in terms of how they look at their world, how they think about the world, uh, the amount of water they use, uh, the amount of electricity they use, this is gonna have a profound impact. It's much cheaper than windmills or solar panels. So it's incredibly important. We know education works, seatbelt seat laws or seatbelt education has worked, it's had an impact. Driver education saves lives. Financial literacy works. But for these, these things to work, they have to be interdisciplinary. It can't be a one day event on Earth Day or World Environmental Day or Arbor Day that we discuss climate change. It's critical that it's done uh, throughout the curriculum and we build on prior knowledge. Thank you. Um, those are great points. Thank you so much, uh, Hank. Um, by the way, I would be remiss if I didn't say that I, I, uh, your name is uh, legendary in our offices, given that you actually taught my wonderful chief of staff, Stephanie Lagos, many years ago. So just, just want you to know what goes around comes around, Hank. Um, so Kelly, Kelly, maybe you can add something here. Thank you so much for having me here today. I wanted to start by saying it is incredible to be part of a state that values our environment and the world we pass on to the children we teach. I'm so proud that New Jersey has taken such a large step to ensure that our students will be prepared and ready to face the climate change challenges and work towards solutions. I believe that the climate crisis is within our power and ability to change, reverse, and repair, and that we must empower our students to use their voices to articulate and defend their beliefs. This starts with developing a love and admiration for nature. Teaching climate change education will allow our students to realize that we have a responsibility as humans to something larger than ourselves. This encompasses every standard no matter where you teach. Global awareness is a 21st century skill and the climate crisis is a global crisis. From science to social studies, the arts, health, physical education, math, language arts, we can instill environmental stewardship in each of our students. I'm a K-5 STEM teacher at the George Catronbone School in Long Branch, New Jersey. I teach problem-based learning curriculum that allows students to learn through solving open-ended real-world problems current in today's world. Many of the problems we dive into have an underlying environmental theme. We cover themes like the changing earth, the sun, the moon, and the stars, energy, robotics, and many more. 
A few years ago, our district began participating in Sustainable Jersey for Schools program. And this really began our inclusion of environmental education. Using their actions in three categories of people, prosperity, and planet, we began introducing our kids to many of the environmental concerns that we have in today's world. We established green teams in our district, as well as the individual schools. From there, with the help of the Alliance to Save Energy and New Jersey Natural Gas programs, we started an after-school club of students focusing on energy conservation. The Power Save team looked at the ways we consumed electricity in our building and how we could reduce it. The students audit classrooms around the school and focus on three simple behavior changes, turning the lights off when you leave a room, closing windows and doors when the HVAC is in use, and shutting down appliances when they aren't in use. These simple behavior, these simple behavior changes allow our building to reduce energy consumption and it saved a lot on the energy bills too. We planted a large garden growing a variety of vegetables, herbs, and flowers for our students, not only to learn about the growing process and life cycles, but to connect this to growing your own healthy food to eat. We sampled a lot of these along the way. The sampling of these vegetables was a first experience for many of our students. The students sell their produce at local farmers markets and even get to practice cooking with the fruits and veggies. The harvest grown is also donated to many of our families and local food pantries. Last year, we harvested over 800 pounds of produce. We recycled over 2,000 soda bottles to build a greenhouse in our courtyard, helping to extend our growing season. Our students monitor outdoor air quality. They sing and perform music and skits about the environment. They're very interested in saving turtles, and they have worked hard to learn about and protect these sea animals. They campaigned to give up straws in our lunchroom in an effort to save these turtles, and took it further to convince our school district to stop using plastic straws in the cafeterias. Knowing they could do more, they wrote letters and visited local restaurants, encouraging, encouraging them to go straw-free in LB with them. They felt this wasn't enough, so they wrote letters to our mayor and city council. They were invited to a public meeting to present their ideas in front of him and our city council about the dangers of single-use plastic. Their work influenced the mayor and council to pass a citywide ban on single-use plastics, and this goes into effect in December of this year. They are entrepreneurs making and selling turtle necklaces to raise and donate money to help save injured turtles, and they have many more plans to come. You can see climate change education is not a singular thing to address. It encompasses a large area of themes and learning, and it is easily infused across, across all curriculum standards. It's making a connection to something that impacts your community and making a difference. Thank you so much, Kelly. Um, I'm really glad to have seen your work firsthand and I can attest for all of the incredible things you're doing there. Um, Tracy, you're up next. Um, I wanted to uh, thank you for having me here today. It's quite a pleasure. Um, I'm also very grateful that now the New Jersey Student Learning Standards have incorporated climate change and sustainability and educational education, uh, education for everyone. So through pairing with the standards, um, our school recognizes that um, we like our students to focus on problems and solutions for change. Um, it's offered, it's fostered hope and instilled a sense of agency and efficiency. Um, by making solutions very an integral part of the overarching lesson unit, they, um, students have been able to work in group-centric, not individual, and focus on energy shifts and energy efficiency. Okay. Thank you, Tracy, and thank you for joining in our climate change video um, a few weeks ago. That was really good of you to be there. Um, Frank, last but not least. Sure. So I, I, I'm, uh, as a former classroom teacher myself, uh, to hear the three teachers that went before me uh, uh, reminds me why teachers are such an important part of this process. And Hank, I, I heard you loud and clear when you said education works. Education is the cheapest way to solve climate change. If I got that close, um, that's a really important statement. So I just want to bring that forth again. Um, it is my, my job to know what's going on across the country, uh, not just to know what's going on in one state or one municipal or one district. And so um, what we're seeing, and to, to get to one of the elements of your questions, uh, how do I refer to you? I, I, I want to say Tammy, but uh, you know. I answered everything. Tammy is totally fine. Whatever you want. <laughs> I don't mean to be <laughs> informal, uh, but uh, here we are. Uh, so, um, 
but, but what you guys have done in New Jersey is incredibly important. And you, you've taken something that we in our community uh, didn't even ha aspire to back in 2006, 7, 8, um, when we started developing the national uh, approach to climate change education. Um, and, and we didn't really have the audacity to go across the entire curriculum. But as the years went on, uh, it became clearer and clearer that this is all students, all standards, all classrooms, all teachers. This issue does not sit in just a science classroom or earth science classroom or environmental science at all. So the fact that you've, you've led the change and you know, we've, I think that the cliche statement that states are the laboratory of democracy, I think that you guys have shown that absolutely no other state has tried to do as ambitious and audacious and important work as new jersey so you set a, a really high bar um and uh so i just want to congratulate you all for 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 shooting that high because it's it's the right thing for our students um but the other thing is is that know that uh there are wonderful partners and organizations and institutions that have been joining you in this process across the country. So part of my, my responsibility is to connect you to wonderful professional development organizations, one curriculum development organizations and institutions and resources that are developed so that you don't have to start from scratch. Just know that you're not alone here. Um, there are districts that are doing what you're doing, but no state. But there are parts of states that are doing interesting work. So you know, just know that you can rely on, on me and my team to help you bridge to other efforts, because it's a, it's a, it's a lot of work you've just uh, signed up for. Um, it's the right work, but it's a lot of work. So uh, if we can help you in that process, we are here, ready, willing, and eager, to uh, to match your uh, ambition with with effort and capacity. So, congratulations, New Jersey. Um, I hope others will see this standard and and uh, rise uh, further. I think that is very helpful information, Frank. I know that uh, many people are nervous about this, so knowing that you're out there with a lot of materials is really helpful, so thank you. Absolutely. Um, our, our next question is for Kelly. Um, so Kelly, the question is, how do you anticipate changing any existing lessons to implement the updated K-5 to climate change standards? And is there a specific aspect of the new climate change standards that you are excited to teach? So climate change education is already a large part of my lessons, but I anticipate, anticipate making more connections throughout the STEM curriculum, um, adding more insight and diving a little bit deeper into some areas related to the modules that our students are working on. Um, but I'm really most excited about the social studies standard. Uh, so, so, social studies is not infused in STEM classes as much, so I'm really interested in engaging in the civic side of environmental education with my students, helping them make connections and understanding how they can make their local and global communities a better place to live and building on their self-esteem and becoming active citizens. Um, that's fantastic. Thank you so much, Kelly. Um, our next question is actually for Tracy. Um, Tracy is a district green team coordinator and a staff and student support teacher. How have you worked to ensure the entire school and district incorporated environmental education and what barriers did you face? Well, fortunately, I have the support of teachers, principals, the superintendent, board of education, and our director of curriculum and instruction for STEM and technology. Having the investment from key stakeholders is key to all success. Our lessons are aligned with the New Jersey student learning standards and exposed enduring understandings of sustainability. We use opportunities to link lessons to sustainability initiatives taking place in the school, such as school gardens, green cleaning, energy conservation programs, and upcycling initiatives. I'm also a member of the Safe Walking and Cycling Committee. The Highland Park School District adopted a transportation policy that embodies safe routes to school. With their support, students promoted active travel, such as a walking school bus and a biannual walk to school day while learning about pedestrian and bicycle safety. Since 2015, we have been active in the Sustainable Jersey for Schools, who offers actions where schools can earn points 
And most of these actions provide opportunities to integrate student learning. Sustainable Jersey for Schools was instrumental in providing grant opportunities and served as a vehicle for integrating student learning into school sustainability initiatives. I have the pleasure of working with the middle school, high school, um, our lower elementary, as well as our two to five grades. And the work, the students are very enthused, the actions are attainable, and everyone is engaged. So that has you know, helped support um, our staff and, and administration. Uh, a barrier we have faced from students is teaching new ways of thinking about the realities of our world and the possibilities for change in our climate. Some students feel like we've been working on this for so many years. We've um, twice been bronze certified um, and they're waiting, like sometimes they want to instantly see a change and it's just letting them know that it takes time. Okay, well, thank you so much, Tracy. I am sure this is going to be a learning process for all of us. Um, one one follow-up question on that. In your personal experience, what is the importance of having a whole of district or school approach uh, to teaching about the environment? The whole district and school import approach is important to promote the district-wide efforts to educate, conserve, and explore options to create an eco-friendly community. Recently, board leadership planning and the green team provided professional development for sustainability for the district, focusing on climate change. The professional development was designed to equip students, teachers, and school systems with the new knowledge and ways of thinking we need to achieve economic prosperity and responsible citizenship. The focus was on incorporating sustainable education in the curriculum, encouraging sustainable thinking in everyday life and behaviors, and an enormous amount of resources for teachers. Throughout the year, evidence showed that the participants developed a personal rationale for sustainability and were able to effectively educate the effects of climate change impact. The schools have become more efficient, um, have become a more efficient green district through the implementa implementation of better energy saving and environmental practices. The rewards of our strategies have installed a culture of conservation, reinvestment of saved expenditures for schools and students, and an overall sense of community ownership and, and sustainability. Um, as we've all know, it takes a village to make a change. Students need to see environmental issues as not just something they learn about in science for a unit of study, and then that's it, but know that they can continue to educate others and do things outside of the school setting. Great, thank you so much, Tracy. It's, it's really impressive how you have worked to implement um, everything across the school and the district. Um, okay, Hank, as the lead writer for New Jersey Social Studies Education Standards and an expert on curriculum development from the standards, what is your impression of the integration of climate change in the social studies standards specifically, and how do you envision, envision the curriculum adjusting? Uh, very good question. Uh, very good question, Tammy. Let me maybe try to answer that question by asking all of you, you know, a question. Um, let me share with you uh, the K-2, three interdisciplinary standards that are, that are in the New Jersey curriculum. First, I'm gonna start with the one of science, which is probably the one with most information. Uh, communicate solutions that will reduce the impact of climate change and humans on land, water, air, and other living things in the local environment. Let me give you the social studies one, which is what we call in New Jersey 6.3. So it's more related to research and presentation than to an actual content lesson, you know, such as studying the national parks. This is grades K to two. 
investigate a global issue such as climate change, its significance, and share information about how it impacts different regions around the world. The third one is really quite unique, and that is teachers of art and music also are teaching about climate change. What the, one of the standards here is identify, share, and describe a variety of media artworks created from different experiences in response to global issues, including climate change. New Jersey teaches 1.6 million students. Each of those students theoretically has parents and grandparents, so we probably impact as teachers uh, half of New Jersey's population, if not more. So 4 million out of the 8 million people living in New Jersey. As you have heard, New Jersey is a densely populated state and climate change will greatly impact everything we do. Unfortunately, um, it's almost too late now in 2020 to be informing students about the causes of climate change. It's rather, how are we going to deal with the impacts and effects? So an example of what I would suggest in working with local districts is begin first of all with the local before you go to the national or you go to uh, global. Every student in every fifth grade student, I got grandkids, wants an iPhone 11. Wonderful. Other than the thousand dollars it might cost for the iPhone 11, how much electricity does it use to charge the batteries? Think about that. Not only your battery, but the 500 people that are in our elementary school, the 2,000 people, the 30,000 in our community, and the list goes on and on and on. Think about water usage. I used to have my students do a study of how much water do we use at uh, Ramapo High School. Uh, each person uses maybe 80 to 100 gallons of water a day. So if you think about that, how many times do you go to the bathroom in school in your home, your home is using maybe 500 gallons of water a day. Where does it go? We have to be sure that we have clean water. Most of New Jersey gets its water from underground. So this is what I mean by local issues, extremely critical and important. On the high school side, one of the things that we ask high school students to do is collaborate with students from around the world. While it's easy to find resources in Europe, most likely, it's incredibly important that we look to Brazil or Colombia, places in Africa where there's a lot more biodiversity and, and, and species that are affected. So these are the opportunities for us that, um, Climate change today is not just about science, it's economics, it's the cost, it's ethics, it's for future architects to think about designing buildings uh, with recyclable material that are green and et cetera. So that's what we wanna do is work with districts to customize the curriculum, that this is something that's incremental K through 12, it's not something that's a, a one-day activity, but it, it emphasizes decision-making, civic engagement, and uh, curriculum instructional practices like that. Thank you. Um, that is incredibly helpful, and I, I thank you so much. I'm in, so grateful that New Jersey has such a wealth of incredible and experienced educators to guide us through this process. Uh, okay, going down to Maryland. Frank, you are at bat. Um, the next question is for you. From your perspective at the national level, how do you think New Jersey's guidelines will influence NOAA's climate change work? So uh, there's a couple easy parts to this question. Um, one is you've, you've put yourselves on the radar. Um, and, you know, we at NOAA can't work everywhere all the time. Uh, so what we tend to do is focus where we can make the most progress. Um, for the past number of years, we've been focusing on New York City, uh, and we've established a, a climate education and resilience task force with the, the, the city's government and a, and a consortium of other organizations uh, really looking 
at how can uh, all of us work together to solve this, uh, these challenges and these opportunities. Something similar like comes to mind here. Uh, when you think of NOAA, you have to think about a very large network of organizations. We have estuarine research reserves, we have sea grants, we have climate research uh, stations and, and scientists all over the place. So, I mean, I think the, the, it'll, be de it'll be determined on, on how we respond, um, is, is how can we coordinate that activity? Who can we work with to make sure that what we have, what we can have, and all our partners are aligned with, with the initiatives that are going on across the state of New Jersey. Um, I think one of the most critical things that we are seeing um, is coordination structures. If we don't know how to help and we don't know how to connect what we have with those who have needs and vice versa, um, it's really hard to be of, of maximum use. So uh, I would encourage uh, all of you to think about how we build some kind of coordination structures to be maximally uh, aligned in the shared purpose. If we don't, it's just going to be really hard. But I can tell you, um, we're taking notice. Uh, and we bring a great deal of depth to it. And also, if you remember in my, my, uh, my bio, interagency uh, is also how I work. So, you know, I used to coordinate 18 federal agencies, including NASA and EPA. Sorry for the lawnmower. But as we all know, we're all home. And of course, the lawnmower in my neighbor's yard is going off right now. Of course. But uh, so, uh, you know, there are other federal entities and then we also have to acknowledge that there are other national or important partners that are around the country. So we have coordination structures and networks that we support um, at NOAA on climate change education. So, you know, uh, I really think that lining up how, how you're moving forward and, um, and one other thing I will definitely say is that the movement for the last number of years is definitely much more interdisciplinary than um, just science domain. So, uh, and definitely elementary is showing up very strongly. Um, looking at the intersection of race and justice and climate change is also showing up very strongly. So um, I think that uh, this is a rich opportunity for us. And I, I've noticed in the, in the very sizable participant number, there's a lot of activity in the chat that probably gives us some indications of how we might be able to be of service and of use here. So um, I'm not paying too much attention over there in that, that very active space, but um, I think that uh, the, the wealth is, there's a lot there, but if we can figure out how to harness it, then we might have an opportunity to make good progress in the very short term. Incredibly important points. And I think the commentary about the interdisciplinary approach is so appropriate. I, I uh, have experienced that firsthand in, in at least one school in New Jersey where um, I went into social studies class next to the history class and history was talking about the building of the Panama Canal and waterways. And then the social studies class was saying, you know, what did that do to uh, the people? And then you went into science and they said, what happened with the animals being able to migrate north? It was just a, it was just a really inspiring um, interdisciplinary conversation to, to watch. Okay, so next I have another question for Kelly. Um, what advice would you give to your fellow classroom teachers on incorporating climate change and environmental education into lesson plans? So I know it's hard because teachers get a lot of stuff coming at them and new things to incorporate every year uh, and it builds and it can be stressful at times, but climate education starts with a love of nature, getting your students outdoors, interacting in nature, the soil, trees, plants, flowers, looking at the biodiversity around your school and the community, starting a garden, any type, watching birds, examining trees, start a recycling project. Talk about and brainstorm an environmental or climate concern happening right in your own community. It doesn't matter how you start, you just need to dive in. Find a topic you are passionate about. Your students are passionate about other things. Do some research and start making a difference. For us, it started with a picture you all have probably seen, a turtle with a straw lodged in its nostril. It ignited a curiosity and fire within our students to make a difference and change the status quo. We looked at it as a problem, we researched, we learned, we planned, we petitioned, we made models and tested them. We kept making improvements and pushing the boundaries, uh, improving, aiming for larger audiences, and we haven't stopped. Our students are passionate about making a change. They are environmental stewards and innovative, and they inspire me.
Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I apologize. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm having, with one of my four children, somebody keeps trying to call me. So I'm going to uh, kick off this next question and disappear for two seconds and find out what's up. Um, apologies. Um, so Hank, same kind of question for you. As a former high school social studies classroom teacher and supervisor, what advice or guidance would you give to a current high school teacher or supervisor looking to implement these standards? Okay, well, thank you. Um, the first thing I think I would do is in each district call a curriculum summit meeting. Uh, you want to bring supervisors, teachers, parents together to discuss clear objectives about what you want to do in regarding climate change. One way to look at this is uh, everybody's familiar, I guess, with text messages. Well, the word text comes from textile. Textiles have threads. So the way I see curriculum is there's this thread, as the first lady was saying before, with our example about the Panama, Panama Canal and how it affected uh, animals and, and the environment. So throughout the year, there are these connecting points to talk about the environment. Uh, the topic can change overnight. Uh, if there's a volcano in the next uh, three or four weeks before school, that's going to have a tremendous impact on carbon emissions. It's going to change the discussion. We've already had six or seven uh, tropical storms are named hurricanes. If one of them hits the East Coast or travels, it's going to change the discussion. Natural events clearly cause urgency uh, to understanding these issues. The, um, you also need to partner, I think, as a, a, a district with the local college. Um, I'm at uh, the New Jersey Council for Soul Studies, is located at Rutgers. Uh, the state climatologist is uh, also there. So there's a lot of resources locally that you can look at. You also have to look at the history. For example, um, many of you are probably very familiar with Lower Manhattan. And if you go down the Wall Street area, you, you know that there are streets there called Water Street, Pearl Street. Well, the reason it's called Pearl Street is two, 300 years ago, there were lobsters there. Uh, there were oysters there. Uh, the Fulton Street, Fulton Fish Market. Even in Newark Bay, 300 years ago, there were lobsters. So one way to you know, approach this from an instructional point of view is just brainstorm with students, what's the oldest tree in our community? Well, I don't think there are any trees in New Jersey that go back more than 300 years. Why is that? Well, there was deforestation 300 years ago. Houses were built out of wood, so blame whatever group you want to blame, but um, environmental changes and impacts have occurred here uh, for many times. You also need professional development. Um, I will be asking, okay, uh, through my state uh, assemblyman and, and state senator, can we get some money, $250,000, $300,000 would do it, uh, to do professional development work for on an interdisciplinary nation for school districts. You can't do this piecemeal. We, we've come to a critical point uh, I think teachers want this. It wasn't just myself and my team who, 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 who wanted it. Uh, we have support. As Kelly said, we have passion. So that's how I would approach it, working with colleges, working with parents in the community, the interdisciplinary team at the high school, clearly focusing on goals and resources. That's how I'm spending a lot of my summer. I'm developing resources based on the standards, I'm trying to put them in a thematic approach, okay, for, uh, for supervisors to look at and ready to go in September. By the way, these are fully implemented September, 2022. So, but there'll be a lot of experimentation in the next, uh, in the next year. Thank you. Thank you, Hank. Um, okay, so I now have a few questions for each of Kelly and Tracy. Um, many people are curious about how a complex issue like climate change can be taught effectively at the K-5 to level. So how would you respond to them? Um, and if you have a specific example, can you share with us 
how your students have reacted to learning about climate change. There's more. Um, what, what have been some of your most impactful lessons to date and who of each of you would like to respond first? Um, I'll go first. Uh, climate change can be taught effectively by encouraging students to take action, such as staying informed during morning meetings, incorporating climate change and cross-curricular practices, and making transportation a priority. Through social emotional learning, we empower our students with values of environmental protection and responsibility with our natural resources. We stress that, being, that by being self and socially aware, students can make a difference by handling problems before they get worse and to work hard to shield and safeguard habitats and people from harm. Teaching about climate change prepares students for their roles in, cre in creating a sustainable future. Students are engaged in actions that integrates knowledge across different disciplines, and that considers diverse social, economic, and cultural perspectives. These skills and approaches also position students to perform more successfully across the school curriculum and prepare them for higher education and careers in the 21st century war world. For courses like physical education, you could discuss climate change as it relates to a healthy lifestyle, walking, bike riding, carpooling, et cetera. In addition, um, you know, with lifestyle changes, with the gardens, we have many students who are vegetarians, they're growing their own vegetables, and our gardens at our schools are community gardens, so it's open to everyone. Um, the students are also involved in giving to, donating the uh, vegetables, um, at the end of the crop season to the um, to places where students can go and pick up food and places in our community that are readily available to them. Uh, if I had to think about um, a lesson that was just really stood out to me, I did a lesson on biodiversity through characteristics of native plants in their habitat. Students discovered what living things need to grow and learned the various stages of a plant's lifespan, along with new vocabulary words. So through grants and funding from Sustainable Jersey Schools, we turned an outdoor space into a learning course. We studied this lesson on many levels. At the highest level, we looked at different species on Earth that would be able to thrive on certain plants. On a much smaller scale, we study biodiversity within a designated area in a neighborhood park. Students thought about the types of plants they have seen around their homes, near school, in local parks, or in nearby natural areas, and discussed the purpose of having pollinators as plants. The students predicted that the plants would be located in a secure area that would attract pollinators but not disrupt other plants located near their habitat. They also felt the plants would grow and remain healthy in their new habitat. They are still able to see the effects of their work, which was tremendous. Um, while we were outside um, doing our lesson, in math, we used the trees to um, identify shapes, cylinder, you know, this tree is a cylinder. Um, we measured, um, the distance between the native plants and other plants that were provided. So we used, um, I want to say all uh, writing, everything was journaled, um, all the disciplinary actions across the board in doing that exercise. And then the reward for the students that we were highlighted in the classroom, in a classroom close-up series. Um, and the students were overjoyed by that because they saw that they were making a difference and they saw the impact it made and the um, feedback that they got from their live presentation. Thank you. So when I thought about uh, this question um, while you were speaking, Tracy, I really wanted to address the, the younger students that we teach, especially in a K-5 school, that we're not 
teaching standards and causing harm by scaring them and doing some of the advanced uh, data, using some of the advanced data that we have out there. Um, but we're looking at the climate problems in our own community. Um, on the Jersey Shore, flooding is a, a large climate problem and it's due to sea level rising, high tides, in addition to all of the storms uh, that we have and, and we've been having in the area. Um, and we talked about it in terms of relating that to drinking water and how some countries don't have clean drinking water. Uh, and we have all this excess water and um, what it takes to be able to use some of that. And we looked at water filtering and that's probably uh, one of the most favorite lessons I've taught. Um, the students looked at all this research and they designed their own water filtration system with sand and pebbles and uh, larger pebbles and coffee filters and tested how effective they could design a filter to filter the water and have it drinkable in the end. Um, we looked at all the results and voted on which one would be the best to drink. Um, none of it, we didn't drink any of it actually because you know, there was no way to test it other than looking at the difference in clarity of the water. Um, but it really sparks an interest. And I, I said it before, the kids need to have a, a, a passion for nature. And I really think that's the foundation, especially in elementary classrooms, that they're outside and really involved in what's happening in the world around them, in the, in the trees, the flowers, the plants. They see that connection and they know that they're connected to that as well. We're not separate from nature, we're all a part of it. And that foundation is really important to starting climate education in uh, early childhood and elementary classrooms. Um, thank you, Tracy and Kelly. Um, I am always impressed by how creative our teachers are, and thank you so much for sharing all that you're doing. Um, I think the inclusion piece was, uh, that both of you discussed is really important. I think also our kids are probably smarter than we might give them credit for, so thank you for that. Um, okay, Frank, my last question is coming your way. Um, what gives you the most hope in your climate change education work as you look across NOAA and across the country? Uh, actually, that's a really easy question. Um, it, it's a two-piece question answer. One is the students. You just alluded to it, and absolutely, as a former classroom teacher myself, I'm not a big fan of that former part, but I guess it's true. Um, you, you know, the, our students—they're amazing. Um, and and you know, one of the most important things I've learned from them as I've done this work for the last 15 years is. Um, a lot of times the weight of this topic bears down on adults pretty heavily. And, um, and, and they feel that weight too, but they flip to the solution and they get all in on the solution really fast. Um, and I think that that, that is, a, that is a, a power and a resource that we need to support, nurture, and um, bring to forth, right? Because uh, we need it. Well, there's a lot of work to do. I mean, I know in New Jersey, you guys are going to erect a massive wind farm all up and down the coast. You've got probably the most wind, wind potential in the nation on the offshore, uh, something like that. Um, that's a lot of work. And we're gonna need a lot of hands and a lot of minds and a lot of innovations and a lot of solving of problems in order to make that happen. And they're ready to go. Uh, we just need to support them and give them the tools, the power, and the skills. And, and so I get a tremendous amount of hope from, from their ability to take the weight, and it's heavy, and, and turn it into action and, and work and good work. So, um, and then the second piece is I have enormous respect for the teachers. Uh, anyone in education, I have just tremendous respect. Um, and so, you know, the fact that, that this is not an easy topic to teach, it's not, let's just be straight. Um, but uh, the fact that, that we have teachers and educators and systems rolling up their sleeves to figure out how to do right by their students um, is incredibly hopeful as well, because we have a lot of infrastructure. It's not like we have to create a bunch of schools or create teachers. Um, that exists. It's, so there's, a, there's another resource there. So between those two, between the teachers and the students, and I, I also, it's not just student, it's not just teachers, I'm sorry, it's educators, because there's a lot of informal educators that play a critical role in supporting our students in this space. It's not just the teachers, they're not alone, it's not just the professors, and it's not just the informal, it's actually the combining of them. So 
I think that, you know, uh, aligning those resources to support our students is really a, a wonderful opportunity. And I think that that's, that's an opportunity that sits before you guys now that you've taken on this big commitment. <laughs> it's wonderful. But that's where I get my hope, uh, honestly. Just get, get, talk to some of the young leaders that are working in this space and you walk away uh, feeling like we might actually be able to turn the boat and not, not hit the iceberg. So uh, echoing a few of those comments, I would like to say um, several things. First of all, I'm thrilled that NOAA has noticed that we, want, we are going to be the, uh, the wind port of uh, the East Coast. I'm glad that you noticed that. You comment on that, Frank, that, that gives me hope. Uh, secondarily, uh, you know, we, we uh, Phil and I laud our teachers. We are so grateful for our teachers. Um, we recognize that, that absent our teachers, our, our state, our country, our world would be really at a loss. Um, and our children, our four children spend more time with their teachers than they do with us. So grateful for our teachers and they do give me hope as well. Um, I think I'd also like to just comment on the fact that, you know, while New Jersey was the first to incorporate climate change into our education standards. We are sitting on the edge of our seats, just waiting to see uh, which state will get in line and do the same thing and, and start uh, sharing this across the country. Um, you know, time has flown by, uh, which I can't believe, but I would like to ask maybe each of our panelists if they want to share any closing uh, thoughts with us. Well, I'm happy to share. Um... Thank you for convening this. I, I learned an awful lot. Um, one, I know it's the information age, but uh, the, the climate change education is really not about information. It seems to be more about building the passion within students and how we can get them to think and act and change behaviors. Uh, while I was reflecting, I was thinking about at least 15 of my students who are actively involved at the national level with um, EPA, One's the director at the University of Washington of their climate change program, you know, at Columbia, one's in Australia. Um, I didn't do anything directly to put them on a path uh, to do work with the environment or climate change, but it came out of my class. And, and that's what's uh, a, a, an exciting sign of opportunity for every teacher, I think, to think about it. When I think of my own education, uh, I mean, School 18 in Patterson, Arbor Day. That was a huge thing for me, learn about trees. In the 60s, it was Rachel Carson, Pete Seeger, Janis Joplin. A lot of the music really impacted me. And my first year of teaching, 1969 to 70, it was the first Earth Day. And I have done activities with that every year. Unfortunately, in a lot of schools, it's developed into or evolved into concerts. But it used to be we'd go down to Fifth Avenue, Newtown Creek in the city, and we would clean things up. So this is an exciting initiative. It's not going to happen overnight, um, but we're on the right path. I like to say that although it seems overwhelming to incorporate something new into curriculum, teaching and learning, if you focus on thinking of incorporating the theme of climate change into your course content, it is not as overwhelming. You do not need an overhaul, rather providing students choice and a voice to think about climate change in the context of what you are teaching. I also want to um, mention again with Jersey, um, Sustainable Jersey for Schools, they're rolling out um, a new digital schools program. Um, this program is um, designed to introduce sections or actions for sustainable journeys for schools and provide guidance on effective use of technology and education and communication. I also wanted to um, share a project as when you mentioned the trees, I thought about, um, it's so important to collaborate with the community. Our district's green team, along with the Highland Parks Municipal Green Team, strive to empower our students to make our schools and community a sustainable environment to live and learn. A recent collaboration in the tree planting project is what I wanted to talk about. By working together, the district green team and the municipality were able to obtain a $30,000 grant from the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection 
that students use to plant over 75 trees in all of our schools. So this was in partnership with Rutgers Cooperative Extension and based on input from the school leadership, science teachers, the high school environmental club, and interested uh, community members. Uh, the Municipal Shade Tree Advisory Committee wrote and submitted the grant to the state's urban and community forestry, forestry pro program. And starting with the design concept provided by Rutgers Landscape Architect, the High School Environment, Environmental Club um, were able to select the tree species and the planting sites. So a small native fruit tree orchid, wetland and upland forest ecological communities, shade trees enhance ex the existing outdoor classroom, our rain garden, our school garden, and it's made it into a natural learning laboratory. So working together through collaboration is a win for the schools and the environment. Thank you. Okay, do you I want to go next? Go, go, go ahead. ahead please. No, 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 I was waiting for you. <laughs> I think to wrap it up, I, it's important to remember that you're not alone doing this. Um, we're, we're all doing it together and it's a learning process. And as teachers, we're perpetual learners. We're always learning something new and you don't have all the answers in the beginning. Uh, and, but there's so many resources that you can reach out to uh, from other teachers in your building to local colleges and universities, uh, Sustainable Jersey for Schools, Eco Schools, National Wildlife Federation. It, it's all there for your support and reaching out to them helps you and it helps your students. And I think the important thing to keep in mind is that your students are leaders and they will take you where you need to go and you need to support their passions and interests in doing this. Um, they have so many great ideas and uh, it, it's just really inspiring to let your, your learners lead the way. Uh, building on what you said, Kelly, spot on. Absolutely everything else as well. But, but you know, one of the things uh, that I, I think is important, um, as, as, as important for teachers and for, for educators and also important for students and communities is to, to know that we're well on our way to, to solving this problem. We're not all the way, we're, but we're not starting from nothing. And um, one of the, the important things that I track that I saw uh, released at, um, when, when Governor Murphy was speaking at the Global Climate Action Summit was the America's Pledge Report, which shows subnational climate action visualized. In the 2019 report, it clearly shows that there is a significant and robust amount of climate action work going across New Jersey and at the New Jersey level, but even below that. You can't even see the state if there's so much going on. Other states, you can clearly see the states. New Jersey, you can't. And what that means is that, that it's not like the, the you, you had asked me before about hope. There's another bit of hope that's really important is that, that it's not that our students need to solve this. Like, it's not like, oh, we can't, here you are. It's actually not the case. Um, there's so much important work well underway that they need to carry on and accelerate, but not start. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're um, I think it's really, it's just an important thing to know where are we on the story? We're not the beginning, we're not the end. Um, and the, the course we choose is one we'll choose together, but we're well on our way I think we might be at chapter three, maybe chapter four. I didn't say how many chapters are in the book though. So, uh, but you know, we won't know the end until we get there. Um, and it's just, you know, draw strength and examples and make the solutions that are already underway visible for your students, for yourselves, just so you know, where are we on the story? Um, it's just important uh, to make sure we're, we're at the right place. And I think I draw a tremendous amount of hope and, and um, but also shows how much more there is left to do. So at least there's something for our students to do because they're ready to go, um, especially when we support them as much as we're talking about in these standards and with your initiative. So thank you very much for all the amazing work and including me in this important panel. What a great panel. Thank you all so much. Um, you know, like so many of the world's biggest problems, Education is our greatest tool and hope for success. Um, what we have come to understand about the climate crisis in the last few years is that understanding the mechanics of it 
uh, from just a scientific perspective is, is just really insufficient. Um, there's no part of our children's lives that will be untouched by climate change and therefore they need to understand the climate crisis from an overarching perspective. Uh, this will ensure our children are prepared for the jobs in the future green economy. Moving forward, we will need climate literate policymakers, engineers, artists, insurance brokers, city planners, and more. Um, with the incorporation of these standards, along with uh, the creation of New Jersey's Windport, um, which I might add is the very first purpose built greenfield port in the United States, uh, and with our goal of reaching 100% clean energy by 2050. New Jersey is poised to become a leader in the global fight against climate change uh, with a generation of students ready to take the helm. Our vision for the future of New Jersey is one where our students are the leaders in both industry and activism. With our educators, one of New Jersey's most precious resources, I have the utmost confidence that we will help our kids achieve that vision. And with that, I really want to thank again each of our panelists, um, going alphabetically so as not to do anything else wrong. Hank, Frank, Kelly, and Tracy, thank you all. Um, I know we have a huge task ahead of us, um, but we could not be in better hands. Um, so I thank you all so much for your time today and for all you have done and continue to do on behalf of New Jersey students. Um, I also really want to thank Judy and Anne for helping us pull this uh, event off and for um, taking the lead here. And with that, I hand the mic back over to Judy. Thank you all so much. Thank you all so much. So everybody that's listening, please give a virtual clap to this amazing panel. Thank you all so much. What an important discussion. It really is inspiring what all of you are doing and all the chatter in the chat box of resources, what else is happening where we, as Frank is saying, moving down the book so that we might be in chapter three, four, five. Some of the issues that came up and the questions we will continue to answer after this on EE Pro. A lot of you had issues relating to how do we train teachers? How can I get money in my state? What can I do internationally? How do we better link climate to justice? That many of you mentioned the importance of interdisciplinary. So thank you all, a very, very rich discussion. And First Lady Murphy, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to do this, for leading this effort. And you can see you have an enormous fan club. And now all of you have a, not, a much bigger fan club as well because of the importance of what you do every day. So thank you, thank you. And I'm gonna turn it to Anne to close us out. And I am now a part of that New Jersey fan club. So thank you very much. And what a great webinar. I just wanted to take the last few minutes here to let everybody know that you all will be getting the recording, the slides, as well as the summary of the amazing resources and chat chatter that came up in the chat box today. I hope to get that out to you by tomorrow. So look out for your emails. And if you did have questions today, go ahead and I invite you to post your questions and comments and additional resources on our EE Pro page. Go to that same place where you registered for the webinar and add your questions and resources there and everybody will see them. All you have to do is create an EE Pro account. It's free and you can post your resources there. Additionally, if you do want to check out any of our other webinars, you can get all the recordings if you subscribe and link to our YouTube channel. You'll get it there first before you get it in your emails. Um, if you like today's webinar and you want to learn Learn more about our webinar series, check it out, our monthly webinar series. We have so many wonderful webinars. You can see our entire archive of recordings and notes on our website, and you can also see what is coming up ahead. And I want to mention that so many of you asked about resources and support and training as an educator. And as Kelly said, you are not alone. And so I invite you to do one thing today. As you're on EE Pro, also join the Climate Change Education Special Interest Group. You will be joining nearly 500 other educators that are also interested in this topic, sharing ideas, sharing resources, and just getting some practical advice and tips on how do you do this work. So check it out, it's on EE Pro on our website. And lastly, I want to let you all know of our upcoming webinar series, August 6th and 20th, 
all about how do you navigate difficult conversations in the classroom, including how do you talk about climate change issues. We're going to be with Mary Ellen Daniels. She's an amazing educator, civics teacher, and teacher trainer. She's going to be walking us through some of the basics as well as more of an advanced class on what does this look like to facilitate better conversations in the classroom. So join us. You can register for this session already on our website. First part is next week on Thursday. And that is it. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you so much to our incredible panelists, especially to First Lady Tammy Murphy. You all were amazing. And I hope to see all of you on another webinar very, very soon. Take care, everybody, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.